there's a practical thing that people don't think about, and that is like, you can take a bottle of water and set it down, and it doesn't drop 3,000 feet. You can't let go of anything, you know, or it's gone forever. He's climbing again. The only thing it really takes to climb the nose is the willingness to go up there and get scared and kind of go for broke. The first time I climbed El Cap was just like this off the wall, short notice offer from my sister's friend, happened to be a special forces guy in the military. He's like, hey, let's just go climb the Salafe. And I'm like, oh, okay. And we just totally got beat up. And we, we didn't get to a single bivy. We did hanging in our harnesses at night for two nights. I topped out with, you know, no water and food and probably lost 10 pounds, which I didn't have any weight to lose and was just totally bedraggled. And then when I came back to do the nose, Three, three years later, I failed to get up the route. I mean, we climbed all day and got four pitches, right? And we just looked up and like, oh, there's no way we're gonna make it. So we just rappelled down and went back to college for a year. Going and speed climbing the nose is kind of one of the coolest, in my biased opinion, like athletic outings you can do. You're high off the ground and if you can get there fast, it's kind of addicting. I first met Hans as a competition climber. I was, um, you know, a little kid, like 15 years old, doing all the competitions, and he was there doing speed climbing. What I loved about him is he was like the most positively competitive person I've ever met. Like there was no behind the scenes, like passive aggressiveness to Hans. He's like, I want to beat you. And he would like come up to 15 year olds and be like, uh, you know, for every place that I beat you by, you have to pay me a dollar. He did things like that. I am the person with the most successes on El Cap. I also know uh, I probably have more failures than most people on El Cap. That whole progression of being the person who bailed off pitch four and then being the person that climbs it in a few hours is so cool. Like when I speed climbed it with him, I remember we walked to the base and I was looking about halfway up at Boot Flake and there's somebody climbing up Boot Flake. And then we passed them when they were still on Boot Flake. And I was just like, wow, this is such a new world. It's really, really cool to um, go so far. The techniques that he has developed over time are the fastest, best way. He knows it so well that he wants to help everybody experience that. She was the first British woman to walk to the geographic South Pole in 2000. She was the first British woman to walk to the geographic North Pole in 2001, thus becoming the first woman ever to walk to both ends of the Earth. I got invited to the Polish Film Festival, and Fiona was there, who I didn't know, but she gave a show, and you know, we went out and probably had vodka and whatnot and um, told stories. And this was 2008, right? Seven years later, I get an email from Fiona saying, hey, I want to do something special for my 50th. I'd like to climb, you know, the nose of El Cap, and do you think that I can do that? He was very positive, just came back and said, of course you can, um, really come on out, and it was really as simple as that. I was just totally kind of won over by her when she visited and, like, just dropped it and laid it on her, like, well, how about you do the nose with me this, you know, this coming fall, because it'll be my 100th ascent. I'd love to do it with somebody who's doing it like for their 50th birthday, it'd be a nice combo. And when you take people who haven't been on the nose before, you get to see their mouth go and their eyebrows raise and like, oh my God, look at where I'm at, you know. Um, you relive how fun it is that first time. Well, there it is.
Hans was looking for somebody to co-write his next book. So he has a book out now on speed climbing. Kind of like a let's look back on the last 25 years of you know, this obsession with this single route. A couple weeks after we write the thing, she's just kind of innocently, you know, and totally merely like, you know, I really think that maybe uh, you need an embedded journalist on your 100th ascent, <laughs> you know? Oh, like, well, I guess that would be you, huh? Since you're my co-author. And she's like, yeah, yeah. Anyone who has Googled, you know, Bivy on El Capitan, you know, and you see those pictures and the sheerness of it, and it's like, this is really happening. And it's, you know, it's happening in a couple days. Look at this for gear. I've got a real harness, and I'm now a real climber. I'm trying to, as best I can, let Jamie and Fiona know, like, you know, it's totally okay if this is a adventure of us going up to, you know, one third the way up and coming down. Trees are looking small, and that's only after pitch two, so uh, to be continued. I don't know when they hear that from me, if they're giving the roll of the eyes, like, whatever, Hans, you know, you're going to stop out or not. But I'm just trying to give them, like, this low pressure thing that it's going to be a fun and an adventure because the three of us are all adventurers, right? You know, and if we know we're going to top out, it's just there's, there's no adventure in that. And then we just got to work, you know. All the preparations are part of the thing. So we just immediately started doing the adventure. Right? So one thing that did catch me out was perhaps more the size of the haul bags that we had. You know, a few times they were struggling with the winds blowing the rope around the corner. Now the wind's blowing, they're yelling up for me for advice, but like, I can't yell back because the wind's blowing my voice away. And so they're figuring things out on their own, right? So I want to avoid having to take this off if I can. I came out with a lot of expletives and I wanted to yell help, but I thought that's pointless because nobody could hear me. I had to get rid of that and uh, use some girl power, I think is the answer. So first night we made it to the very luxurious El Cap Tower, which is, oh, like just over a meter wide probably, and maybe, maybe 10 meters long. Hans pulled out the cans, and we kind of each picked one, so you could have, you know, your chicken noodle soup or whatever soup you preferred. And I ate mine, and then it was like, what's next? And I, you know, I turned the can of soup around. And I'm like, this has less calories than a Cliff Bar. <laughs> Where's the food? You can't even bring a spoon. So on day two, we hit all the iconic features on the nose. It was like our first glimpse of, OK, here's Texas Flake. Here's Boot Flake. You know, we had the King Swing. And I feel like that section in between Texas Flake and Boot Flake is really, from a big wall climbing standpoint, like, you feel like you're on a big wall. One side of the wall kind of curves around, so all you see is open sky. And you're just very aware of the fact of how high you are and how vulnerable you are, and it was absolutely thrilling. I disappear around the corner right on lead, and, the, and Jamie and Fiona are back here on top of the flake, and like, I've disappeared, and now it's all their gig. It was up to us just kind of put our heads together, despite the fact that we were disagreeing, figure out how to go about this. There were some good swear words there as well. I was not looking forward to reaching the Great Roof because I'd seen lots of video clips. I'd looked on YouTube, and it looked positively terrifying. You hit this just umbrella that opens up to the side, and you have to go straight and horizontal, and there's this roof that actually overhangs backwards on you. And then when I found out that I would be clearing it as well, um, I wasn't looking forward to that. So, so that was an enormous amount of adrenaline going through my body. 
you have like edges that are about this wide that you're standing on and you're just clipped into these little bolts and it just sweeps down below you. So it's a totally spectacular place to be. Ooh, look at that far of you. Oh, holy cow. I think it would have been as hard as this in an aeroplane. So for our second night on the wall, Hans and Fiona were on a portal edge. And then I was up on this teeny ledge, um, literally just laying on the ledge. I had my sleeping pad and my sleeping bag on top of it. And they actually both kind of hung off a little bit. Like it was just the perfect size to fit one curled up on her side, Jamie. And I just, I felt like a bird. I don't know what to say other than it's, it's very special though probably never ever be sleeping in this sort of viewpoint again but it's amazing so I'm just trying to soak in the view and and take it in so this is a view with the sun rise coming on up got that beautiful bluey haze to it now in the valley and look at that it's just gorgeous isn't it Something interesting about Hans is he has a really strong business background. So I think he actually um, studied operations and worked in that field, you know, initially before he, he left uh, corporate America to become a climber. And then obviously he takes that out onto the wall because how do you whittle away more and more time on a speed record? So you think, you know, Hans is going to be more of a serious kind of guy. Um, but what I've found with him is he's, He's serious when he needs to be, but he is definitely a light-hearted spirit. We're just shooting our sort of crazy uh, anchor with all this stuff going on in the lake down there. Sorry, I'm switching the orientation, but all the gear and stuff they're trying to undo. Crazy stuff. Rope handling 305, something like that. Really hard stuff going on here. I'm gonna start moving a little faster. The last pitch was um, horrendous. At one stage, I did wonder if I was going to get up. Um, I was just finding it so hard to get the gear out because you're being pulled away from the rock. Everything's obviously very taut and somehow I've got to get some slack on the rope, be able to get the gear out, get closer to the rock, and just the amount of strength um, was huge. The L cap is brilliant. Like, it, it's, it's vertical, vertical, and the very last bit is just like, you know, gently overhanging, and then it lips like this. And if you don't have someone with you, you don't think about it, you want to pause right there because that's the one spot you can look down the full 3,000 feet down to the thing, and, and you want to take that pause and, and look. It's, it's butterflies in the stomach when that happens, you know. There was a point in time where I'm like, I really don't want to die like this. <laughs> uh, but you know, it, it did eventually come to an end and I crested that final lip and I was like, oh my God, this is really happening. This is the top. Um, and it's funny, I don't remember the moment that well, but I can see photos and the smile on my face, it doesn't even look like me. Like that's the biggest grin I've ever seen. I was absolutely ecstatic. Oh my gosh, I'm at the tree and I just feel like I've won the Olympics. This is the tree that you see on all the movies regarding climbing the nose on El Capitan. So suddenly here I am. Amazing. Amazing. It's important to mark these milestones of the 50th, the 75th, the 100th, and I think by lingering on the route, if you will, longer and, I don't know, wondering about it, um, makes it more memorable. Find us keeping, find us keeping.